is that uh, we have Zoe uh, in 1974. Yeah, 73 actually, we came to the house. Yeah, the recording is 73. And uh, well, we always do this, it's always <laughs> <a year. laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, it was pretty much in the beginning of our relationship and, you know, I'd like to also state that we remained friends with David to the very, very end and, and uh, it was important for us to also be able to represent. So, uh, Robert and I decided to come and uh, do a question and answer, but I'd like to say, it would be wonderful if we could limit that Q&A <laughs> to the period that we just discussed. And if we start talking about all the stuff that I've done, that might leave Robin out, and I don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna leave it to you to, you know, place the direction of your questions on us, and we'll be more than glad to answer any that we can. Hey. Of course. Robin, what's your favorite song to sing in Carlos? What's your favorite song to play from that era? From the Young Americans album? Yeah. Uh, when somebody <laughs> likes me. Yeah. Uh, I love Young Americans because it has sentimental value. That's the uh, <coughs> beginning. But there are other great songs on that album. When. Whenever I hear it, it brings tears to my Absolutely. eyes. It, it just reminds me of the mood that was in that studio. Somebody up there likes me. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the atmosphere, the mood, and the, the family, because we created a family during that time. So those songs were the biggies for me. Yeah, thank you. For me, the minute I hear, boom. Oh. <laughs> oh my god, Robin and I used to have this habit of just turning off all the lights in the house and just playing it. And, and it. Oh, by the way, when the album actually came out, Robin and I were like, what happens with all those great songs, remember? Right, yep. right, because they didn't all make the album. Right? Yeah. And we were like, like, David, you promised. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, what happened? We got cut out. Yeah. And then a few years later, the, uh, the, the new version came out, which had everything. Yeah. And uh, I think that also might have been a wonderfully calculated move by David. Mm -hmm. Well, when we asked him, he was, uh, I had to do something for the record company. And we understood. Yeah. You know, he had to, uh, he couldn't come out with a completely black album. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we had to give him some pop. Yeah. We had to give him something that was poppy, and the poppiest song on that album at the time was uh, Young Americans. Yeah. That was the single. Yeah. And he said, don't worry, it's, got, it's all going to come out. Yeah. And truly, the soulfulness that was David Bowie really came out when that full, full uh, album came out with everything. Then you really got his intent. Yeah. And I think that was extremely important. Absolutely. There was another question? Yeah, I wanted to say that my father took my guitar half away because I quit guitar lessons and he put, him, he put it over at Sigma. Dave Apple had given that amp to me. He used it on the twist and meet me on South Street, New Orleans. And this guy he mentioned the tweed amp in the back. Mm -hmm. It was a 56 Viber Lux. It got stolen for a decade, but I got it back two years ago. And I think about you when it's sitting in there. I always know. Okay. Surprisingly enough, we had a. Uh... During the set is you're 100% right because quite honestly, as an R&B guitar player, if I had a nice Fender amp or a little we twin, twins, they were yeah. twins and supers. And when you got first of all, when you get to the, when you get to a studio, uh, it, like like they said, it's not about it's not about a microphone. No, it's not about the it's not about the place. It's about the studio. What equipment do they have? You know, what do they have here? And when we got there, I mean, of course you have to have. I mean, uh, Earl Slick needs Marshall stacks, yeah. <laughs> and, and like I'm like, okay, you know, that's cool. But a nice little amplifier, it's got a nice tone, and just and when you get to the studio and you hear it, it's just like, oh yeah, we, we this will work, this will work. That was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, definitely. And again, Sigma Sound, kudos because like we like was it, as it was stated in the movie, it it's an amazing studio, and you're right. 
every student, we used to work at, a, well, I used to work at RCA, but Robin would work in all the studios because she was doing, before before any of us, she was already doing commercials and, you know. I did my first commercial at 19 years old for Windex. <laughs> it was called Bring All the Sun In. <laughs> bring all the sun in. Bring all the sun in. Bring all the sun in and let it shine in on me. Well, I'm 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 Checks started rolling, and I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> but it, it's the, it, you know it's those dulcet tones that David heard in the studio, and he was like, "Oh my God, this is it! I got it!" You know, when Robin, I mean, they mentioned it, but when Robin actually said, "Can I bring Luther?" It really rolled into more than that. You know, maybe you could talk yeah. about all the other singers that were there. Well, Luther had a group at the time called Luther. <laughs> uh, and there were two other singers in the group, a, a young lady named Diane Sumler, who we went to high school with. And she was younger than us, and we would always drag her out of school to play hooky and go sing with us. <laughs> and uh, she, was the, she was actually the bridesmaid at our wedding. Uh, she was 16. And uh, we just enlisted her. Yeah. We went to listen to my brother at the Apollo, as he told you, and we needed a soprano, and this chick could blow. Yeah. At 16 years old, an amazing, amazing voice. Dionne Warwick and beyond, Whitney and beyond. And we just convinced her. She's like, well, mother's not gonna let me go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Luther, Luther had the magic. He could yeah. convince anybody's mother to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we eventually got her in the group, and when we did the Young Americans album, he brought Diane Sumner and Anthony Hinton down, who was uh, a singer who sang very much like Eddie Kendricks Eddie Kendrick. from The Temptations. Real Some of you may be too young for that, but a very high falsetto, beautiful, smooth falsetto tenor. And... Uh, we did about five songs before they came down, and then we realized we needed more singers. And that's when it was like, hey, let's, let's bring Diane and Anthony down, you know? And David, at that point, trusted us because we proved ourselves. We proved ourselves in the studio that day that if we said they were good, they were good. They were good. <laughs> so he was like, call them. And that's how we got them there. Next question. Was there, I, I forget if they said it in the, in the documentary. Did David overheard Luther just singing along with you? Yes, yes. Well, we were sitting in, in the sofa, on the sofa in front of the board, and Luther said, but, but we always did this. We, he and I were like two peas in a pot. So if he said, what do you think of this? Ah, ah, ah and I'd go, oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, I'll try that. He said, well, try it. Let's do it. He says, what do you think of this? All right, young Americans, young Americans. All right. Yeah. And over and said, "Excuse me, <laughs> can you sing that again?" And we were like, "Sure," but we were also we didn't we weren't trying for him to hear us. We didn't right. do it for him to hear us. We were just always singing, musicians always thinking, thinking of parts. Ooh, this part may fit here, that part may go there. It doesn't mean that he's gonna like it or use it or want it or even hear it. And uh, he heard it and he said, can you go in the room and record that? <laughs> and we said, hell yeah. <laughs> Not that way. <laughs> It was hell yeah. And uh, we went in there, put those tracks down, dragged Ava in with us. Ava Cherry was there, and uh, D, oh, not D, uh, Jeffrey McCormack, who was named War and Peace at the time. <laughs> and we went in, and we put those tracks down. And the next thing you knew, we put that first song down. I went with, I only went to visit, so I only had the clothes <laughs> on my back. We wound up staying 
and I had to have clothes sent to me from New York. Wow. Luther only had the clothes on his back. Next thing we knew, we were staying at the Barclay Hotel. We were there for the duration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as they said in the documentary, the, uh, the sessions would go on for hours. I mean, three, oh. four, five we know. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd fall asleep in the lounge or fall asleep on the sofa, and David would come over and wake us up. Ready to sing? <laughs> Luther would be snoring. <laughs> and we would, yes, I'm ready to sing. And, and look, I had been working for years on, on commercials, on background, on other people's records, sang on a lot of records before I met David. But there was something, and, and I must say, before I go on to say that, we saw David on the Midnight Special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Wolfman Jack's Midnight Special. And it was when he was still doing Ziggy Stardust. And Carlos and I looked, we were in bed, and we looked at each other and we said, who is this dude? His <laughs> orange hair, he was so white, he was strange. <laughs> A month later, <laughs> that phone call came saying, can you come to RCA? Carlos to record for Lou, and it was David Bowie. Wow. So we have always felt that it was his night, that it was something otherworldly, something karmic, if you believe in karma, something karmic, yep. destiny. So winding up doing that entire album, feeling what that felt like, and there I've done thousands of records, thousands of sessions, that session stands out because it became a family. Even with the Sigma kids, the Sigma kids were the first people who ever made us feel like we were special. I love you. Seriously. And no vice one, versa. No one, not a single soul up until that point had ever asked me for an autograph. <laughs> <laughs> And Luther and I looked at each other when you guys were like, can you get me get your autograph? Oh, autograph. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know. But we saw uh, a camaraderie, a love. There was trust. And they became our family. Mm -hmm. And even if it was a once a year check-in or I'd come down here on tour singing with somebody else, you guys always showed up. So... How could we not show up? <laughs> but those early, early feelings of, gosh, we were young. I was 24, he was 23. Luther was 23. Mm -hmm. You and Luther are the same age. 23 years old. My life had always been in a recording studio up until that point. Up until David, I had not done a tour. I was always singing in the studio. So even when we finished Young Americans and David said, do you want to come out on the road with us? We were like, what? <laughs> Shit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but hell yeah, we want to go on tour. The, David represents, and all of you, whether you know it or not, represent firsts in our lives. Mm -hmm. You never forget a first. Oh, wow. So again, thank you all. Thank you. you. Know, tears to my eyes. It's bittersweet, but it's a wonderful, wonderful tribute, you know, it, to know that there have been people that we've known for, gosh, 40 whatever years. 44 this year. Oh my gosh. Wait, that have stayed really loyal and old. true and loving and into it, into it, and into the fostering of a career. You help to foster those careers. And David never forgot that. That's why he loved you guys so much. Because he had fans, but none like you guys. You know, when we would come out of that studio and you'd still be out there, she'd be <laughs> sandwich, she'd be <laughs> doing some water. How about some blankets, dude? <laughs> <laughs> blankets in the studio. No matter what the weather was, they were there. Yeah, yeah. One more question. Any more questions? Yeah. I have a question. Mm. Uh -oh. So, after you guys would come out of the studio at night, we would go back to the Barclay Hotel 
and you very graciously would invite us up to your room and play cassettes for us of things you had laid down in the studio that night. Where are those tapes? I want to hear them. I've got tapes of everything. I've got massive tapes from all everywhere. I've got tapes from boards, concerts, everywhere. Oh. You know, uh, there, are many, there are many people that would do things like that, but ours is such a personal relationship with David that, I mean, for us to, for us to actually come here, as you know, this is the first. There's many people that, you know, there are a lot of loud voices out there. We're very much, very much private because we live a life that's ours. And so every once in a while, we'll go out to do an album, but then we'll run back home. <laughs> Any more questions, please? One more. No, no, hold on. <laughs> oh, we're going to talk Sorry. about the show? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking that back. But it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Just one of the things that separates young Americans so much is, is the, the, the backing vocals and everything. And one of the, I guess, the most significant track is, is Right. And I was just at the mm. um, exhibit, uh, the David Bowie's exhibit last weekend, and they have the original chart where he plotted out all the syncopation of that. And it's hard enough trying to sing along to it. It's hard, harder to almost read the paper. I'm kind of curious of the, the process of working out those. Well, that was, that was David's process. Uh, pretty much everything else on the record, um, it was a collaboration. Luther, David, myself. Uh, but right, David knew exactly the cadence, just where he wanted everything to fall, just, and it wasn't within the rhythm. So when he presented it, we were like, what is this? You know, we had never seen a chart done, and, and, and it wasn't music. I mean, as you dots. saw it, it was, just dots. it was dots, dashes, and words. So it was like reading, uh, Morse code. <laughs> yeah. It was like Morse, Morse code. I have one of those charts still to this day, a copy of it. Wow. And when I look at it, it's just like, the man was brilliant. Yeah. He was brilliant because he knew how to convey. Even if he couldn't write it down, he knew how to convey what he wanted. And he knew exactly what he wanted on that song. He also had a lot of different methodologies to deal with a lot of different circumstances. Yeah. Let's understand also, he had no idea that he was going to get those singers. Yep. I mean, what do you do when you get something that's as powerful as that? You don't have them do oohs and ahs in the background. <laughs> and so the potential for them being able, and don't forget, Robin, as she stated, the range that was offered to him and having Diane singing all the way on top in a, in a kind of mellowy, mellowy voice. There were two particular methodologies that I found very, very interesting when Luther worked with, uh, with David and thus with Robin. Luther would work with Robin in a way that if you listen to the album in hindsight, you'll find Luther would feature Robin sometimes because Robin has a very, she can belt out a, 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 a voice and, and, uh, and Diane has this kind of crying kind of a, a tonality. So Luther could arrange things in such a way where he would feature Robin. Or he would do something where he would feature himself or feature, you know, anyone. So that kind of methodology was used. But when David found out that he had all these options, his ability to say, well, we, we, we got a call and response, knock, knock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he didn't have to sing it. You know, and it was amazing because you know what? They go, okay. <laughs> okay. And they nailed it. It was wonderful, man. Because it was right up our alley. It, it was what we did. And it gave us a chance to really sing. Because when you're a background singer or you do jingles, well, when you get called for a jingle, you get, can you come in for an hour with a possible half? What? So that means you're going to sing for an hour, and then there's a possibility that something may need to be fixed or rearranged or done, so you have a half an hour to get it in. So when you get to do a record, or you sing, you know, you sing it on somebody's album, where you really get to be a creative part of it, where you... David was very generous in the studio. David uh, 
he, he knew what he had. David was a very smart man, and he knew he had found what he had. So it really turned into, what do you think of this? I think this, what do you think of this? Let me hear what you think. Oh, I like that, go ahead and put that down. It's amazing though that he wasn't expecting you guys to be there. No, and I've often said, if we, didn't, if we had not shown up, you would not know nope. the Young American album as you know it. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the, the singing, the background arrangements, the musicians, they all gave big parts of themselves, yeah. you know. Uh, yes, David knew what he wanted, but David got more than what he wanted, yeah. and he knew that, you know. Thank God for you guys. Another question? Yes. Uh, it's a little, a little odd, but you mentioned in the documentary that the uh, sound of Philadelphia musicians wouldn't work on the album. Did you guys personally, as basically people stepping over a picket line, have any issues with that ever at any point? There was no picket was line no, when we no, got there. Yeah, well, well, you know what? We wall. didn't know. I yeah. didn't know that because I came later. The, the musicians knew that. It was just so, a comment for us, just like you, yeah. like you see in the documentary. It was just incidental. Oh, they couldn't do it. Okay, yeah. so why does that got to stop anything? Yeah. I mean, let, uh, I have worked with the main ingredient, but the shows that we were doing were the, the main ingredient, the Detroit Emeralds, the Shy Lights, you know, the, uh, everybody. Yeah. And, and so the, for lack of a better term, the formulas that, that, that they use, we understood them. But we also understood, you know, you cannot, uh, you, you can't do the, the OJs against the shy lights. They, they're t totally different. So understanding that, what you really got on the album was this smorish board of just soul music <laughs> that you couldn't quite label. But respectfully, that's what music is supposed to be. The ability to take different genres, genres, put them all together, smash them all up into this cluster, and you end up with something that is a hybrid that represents all of the influences that you know, quite honestly, we're, we're on the shoulders of giants. And so we're representing in a way that they would be proud of what we studied. And I think that it came through very well in that particular And moment. we were never told, we were never told, we, David never said, I want this to sound like the sound of Philadelphia. He just said, go forth. Because he knew better. what you do. Because yeah. he knew better. And he happened to like it. Yeah. The thing was, he, when he came to my house, he knew that I was a singer but I had never sung for him. So when we showed up in the studio and we did what we did, he knew right away, well, first of all, these are professionals, they know what they're doing, and they came with a bag of tricks of their own. And he took from that bag of tricks and he saw that he could make it work for him. And that's how that happened. Choices always work. Next question. <laughs> yes. I'm just wondering why uh, you know, the MFSP Again, we don't really know anything like that. That seems to be somewhat more political than we're used to. We're musicians, we're not, you know, you know. So I understand that this happens all the time, but these are just incidental facts to us. Our facts are we got a gig. Yeah. <laughs> so it didn't really matter how we got there, and regretful as that might be, but you know what? We totally understand why they did what they did and why they said what they said. And you know what? This has, as we said, they had just gotten there. Man, can't they just enjoy it for a minute? Can't have nothing more like it. So, you know, we didn't understand any of that, but we were just there to give what we had because basically it was our turn. Yep. Question? Yes. Um, last week was, uh, it was a song called uh, Funky Music that Luther had recorded on his Luther album. And uh, David, first of all, David fell in love with Luther and he saw that he was the well that just kept on springing. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I love you so much. <laughs> um, and David needed another song. He needed one more song. And uh, he asked Luther for the song. 
And like I said, I have a song named Funky Music, and we took a break and went in the studio and we sat down at the exactly. piano. Uh, uh, funky Music. Uh, yeah, it was exactly. Funky Music. But it was Luther's song, Funky Music. Right. And they sat down at the piano, and Luther played it for him. And he was so sweet because he said, I love this song, but fascination is not going to work. He didn't want to, to have that connotation in the album. I, I'm sorry, funky music is not going to work. I don't want to have that connotation in the album. And he said, I'd like to rewrite it. Would you mind? And <laughs> Luther was like, sure. You know, we'll collaborate. They collaborated on it. David really uh, wrote the, most of those lyrics himself. But um, that song had already been recorded as funky music by Luther Vandross. <laughs> Next question. Well, two things. Can you share with us um, what was what went down with the fame with John Lennon, and if you want to? Nothing to it. Because I know you shared this with us, and it was so. Well, cool. fame. Um, we had to leave Sigma and go to New York, and then we actually did it there. It, it, it became more incidental than anything. We didn't really know. I just got called in because we had done uh, funk. Uh, we had done uh, foot stomping. Uh, during the show, and he really liked the line that I was playing on that. But some songs don't really translate when they get to the studio. They kind of, you know, lackluster or wrong tempo or wrong key, whatever. But he did like that line, so later on he called me back, and then I think it was that Electric Lady with Harry Maslin. And then uh, what had that? What he'd done is he'd taken it and just chopped it up into what we call basic blues, the progressions of one, four, five, which is dun dun dun. Dun, 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 hmm. or blues. And so basically you had this very, very simple groove that was just like boom, ch, boom, ch, boom, ch, boom, ch. And I go into the studio and he said, I want you to hear this, I want you to hear this. I'm like, okay. At that point, he was very fascinated with, uh, with uh, uh, John Lennon. They had met a few times before, but he really wanted to cultivate that relationship somewhat further. And to that end, he had, he had invited him down to the studio to maybe collaborate because he wanted to do uh, Across the Universe as a kind of tribute to him. And I think also, as you know, calculating as David was, maybe a little bit <laughs> to, to just get him to come down. And, um, and so he. Uh, he invited him to come down, and he came down. I think he was with May Pang at that time, yeah. and uh, you know they came down, and uh, you know he played acoustic guitar on it. And uh, funny enough, they wanted to go have dinner, and they invited me to come to, have to go to have dinner. But I was hearing these these other lines. See, when I was working with James Brown, <laughs> it started there because I came in at this young kid and he had this three other guitar players. I'd never been in a session with three guitar players. I thought like, oh, I play with James Brown. I'm like, no, you play with James Brown and other three guitar players. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got there and you know there was one, you know, the older guy. He was like, James, 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 real cool. And the other guy was like, playing like one note. He like. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to me, I was like, man, there's a lot of holes in there. So what do I do? <laughs> and like suddenly the older guy's like, hold the hold son, son, where are you going? <laughs> pick a line, just 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 pick one line. I was so embarrassed, I can't tell you. So when that moment came for me to do fame, I heard dun, 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 dun. I heard a million parts. Then I heard that old man tell me, son, slow down man. There's three guitars that you should be thinking about, not just your one. And that's what you hear on fame. What you hear is this classic methodology of James Brown of splitting the guitars so that they kind of like ear candy. And again, the call and response. You know, like, <laughs> and that's what you get when you hear fame. You get this kind of thing. Now, uh, uh, John Lennon is in the studio, and back then this is all the stuff, and he didn't want to get in the way of none of that stuff. He's just basically, 
He's like playing, but the funny thing is when he plays acoustic guitar, he lays his head on the guitar and he kind of, <laughs> and like, we're listening back to the tracks and we keep hearing this, <laughs> and like, oh, what the hell is that? <laughs> I don't know, and then, so the, and, the, and the engineer, Harry, is like, let me isolate it, he starts dropping the tracks out, he drops the drums out. Then he gets to the acoustic guitar, and there's Leonard going, playing the wrong chords, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear, I think that's where David got the inspiration. And ended up being fame. Now, there's a lot of things that I don't know. Any of the other stuff that might have happened, and I don't contest to be knowledgeable about everything. But damn, Aang sure sounded like fame to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so, and then of course there were some other things that happened, which, which was he asked uh, Queen Latifah to come in and do Fame 90, which was like, man, that was awesome. That was great. That was great. Yeah, that was amazing. And I was like, and then, oh my God, James <laughs> Brown stole my rear. Yeah. <laughs> this cast called him to Carlos. Hey, man, I don't know, come. Man, I'm in the studio with James Brown, man. He, he, like, he's playing a record. What, what, what are you talking about? He's playing the record, he's playing fame, he's asking us to reproduce uh -oh. it. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I go to David and I'm like, David, man, James Brown is stealing our song. <laughs> he's like, what? <laughs> and then it was an amazing thing, and it was a lesson that I hold to this day. He basically, I said, Are we going to sue him? And he's like, well, Why would I do that? <laughs> and I said, He stole our song. I said, Carlos, did it place? Did it try? I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> he said, now, if I had stolen that song from James Brown, <laughs> that would have been the New York Times, <laughs> and it would have been like, as you know, oh, here he is stealing from us. But no, because it didn't do anything. There's no one that's going to say that David Bowie stole that from James Brown. And that is so amazingly, I mean, that's a lesson that I, I mean, I, I was under the tutelage of a master. And so I learned a lot of good tricks. I do know a lot of good tricks. He also told me, Carlos, if you, never, if you don't want to do an album, just charge the public. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I made a lot of money that year. Damn my blessing. If you come across a 1X, <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. What was that energy like on the day of the big capture? Oh, what was it like? What were you guys like? You guys were great. Yeah. Yeah. It, first of all, it was the first time yeah. that we, well, we had done Sesame Street, as you know, we had done the first two years of Sesame Street. But that was with Liz and my brother, the, the repertory company we were in from the Apollo Theater. So, Luther and I, we were over the moon to be on TV in New York, where we were from. Oh my God, everybody we knew was going to see 